glorifying the sovereign king. This Psalm 115 was written during the time when the Jews who had been exiled to Babylon, uh, Jeremiah had told them, the prophet Jeremiah told them that prophesied that you guys are going to be captured, you're going to be taken away, and you're going to stay there for 70 years. And this is the prophecy that he told them. But after seven years, he also prophesied that after 70 years, God's going to bring you back to your homeland. So as prophecy was fulfilled, they were captured by Babylonia and they, they, they were sent off there and they, they lived for 70 years in Babylon in captivity. And while they were in captivity, they're sitting there and they know they're living amongst the Babylonians and they see the gods that they are worshiping and you know, they're, they're getting involved in that culture. And when God delivers them, as he did the children out of Egypt, he's going to deliver them out of Babylon and he sends them back. Uh, to rebuild not only the walls of Jerusalem, but the temple itself that was destroyed. Um, these folks are coming back with praise in their heart, thankfully, because they realize that it was the sovereignty of God that not only allowed them to be captured, but it was also his providence that preserved them and his sovereignty that allowed Cyrus to release them, to go back to their homeland. Nothing they did created this. It was God only and his providence that provided a way for them to be taken back to their homeland where they could worship him freely. So, as is often the case, one of the members of the Jewish society, a psalmist, writes a psalm, which we believe it was in this particular one was a song that was sung by the people and as we go through this, you can kind of get an idea on how they would have sung it. Uh, but as they're traveling back to Jerusalem, we believe they're singing this psalm, this hymnal, uh, giving praise to the sovereignty of God. So when we get into this, it says this in verse 1. This is how the song goes. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truths sake. It starts off with, we know there's nothing we have done to deserve your favor. There is nothing we have done to deserve your blessings. We have, we, therefore we glorify in nothing. There is nothing in ourselves that we glorify in. All glory and honor goes to you. That's the beginning of the song. That's a pretty good foundation to build off of. Realizing that I'm nothing, I've done nothing, but you are everything. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. That's the sovereignty. That's the statement that the psalmist wants to make. Let the heathen, let the other civilizations that don't honor and don't know God in heaven, let them question, where is your God? I don't see him. I don't feel him. I don't hear him. Where is this God that you serve? They say that not knowing. And the Jews that are singing this song are saying, but our God in all of his sovereignty is in the heavens. That, that puts their God or our God in a place of complete authority over all the universe. That is setting a standard of where our God is not just the God of the sun or the God on the mountains or the God in the, of the moon or anything. Our God is in the heavens looking down upon all. He is sovereign and he does as he pleases. That's a powerful God. And that is one that is worthy to be praised if he is your God. He does what pleases him. And they're telling, that the psalmist is telling them, we serve this God because of his mercy and for his truth. He is the, truth, he is the true God and his mercy that he pours out upon us, his people, when we don't deserve mercy, and all of his power and his might, he could easily destroy, and, 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 but yet he pours out mercy upon those of us whom he loves. So then he goes further into describing what the heathen, what gods they serve. He describes the heathen as their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not. 
They have ears, but they hear not, and they have noses, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not, neither speak they through their throat. It's interesting that the psalmist is getting down to every detail of the gods that he is familiar with coming out of Babylon, seeing the idols that mankind will set up. Here, man has a desire to worship something or someone, and if they can't see a god, they create one. It's interesting that the God of the Jews, the God of us, created us in his image. But they've created their God in their image. They've brought God to a point where we want to serve and worship a God and we are going to manufacture one that's going to look like us. He's going to have ears and eyes and nose and hands. We're going to worship and pray to this God even though everyone knows that he can't speak, he can't touch, he can't see, he can't hear. Our God is as if the paganistic world, the heathens, are saying, where is your God because we can't understand you worshiping something that you can't see, someone that you can't see or that you can't hear audibly, that doesn't have a form. You know, that's the sovereignty of God that is so ama amazing to us is that when we ourselves, followers of God, lovers of God, children of God, when we try to comprehend God, we fail sh uh, harshly, don't we? We fall short when we try to comprehend him, when we try to visualize him in our mind. What does God look like? No man has seen God and lived. What, he's a spirit, and, you know, but yet he would come down in the garden and speak to Adam and Eve. And you know, he has appeared on the earth in different forms and formats. But here, how can we comprehend a God that has the universe in the palm of his hands? You can't. That's a God that can, is incomprehensible, but yet he tells us that he knows the very hairs of our head. So this God that we can't comprehend has all power, can do anything that he chooses, whenever he chooses, and any how that he, in any way that he chooses, yet he can be personal enough to he can be our God alone that we can speak to this incomparable God. The pagans couldn't understand that. They couldn't grasp that. And if they couldn't grasp it, then they refused to believe in it. And, and that's so, so oftentimes through history of mankind, that's, they fall into the same trap that if you can't comprehend who you're worshiping, then you shouldn't worship. Why, why worship something that you can't see or comprehend? But as the psalmist is saying, we see it everywhere. And as we get into the next psalm later on, we're going to uh, David himself is going to say, well, you can see him everywhere. You don't have to look for him. He's everywhere, and I'll show, I'll show you how. But as this psalmist is saying that these idols that, have, that man has put their trust in can do nothing to help them. When you pray to these idols, nothing happens. They don't move. They don't speak. They don't see you. None of this happens, but our God does. So in verse 8, he makes a statement that's interesting when he says, they that make them make these idols, and we can put today's modern person or human in that, that position, anyone that makes an idol becomes like them. In other words, you worship, or people become what they worship. You will become what you worship. And that's something that we can take out of here and think on and say, wait a minute, that's, that's a pretty good principle to, to think on. We become what we worship, what we put priority on. What is uttermost in our heart, what is, for, what is the first place in our heart is what we worship, and we become that. And the psalmist is saying the pagans worshipped the image that was in their heart. In other words, they created the God that looked like them, meaning that what they really worshipped was themselves. It was self-gratification that was what they worshipped. I won't what I want, I want to be the sovereign and therefore my God that I'm going to worship, I'm going to bring it down to my level and he's going to look like me. And the psalmist is saying that we are going to become who we worship, which is God. We're representative of him and we're not going to become gods, but we're going to uh, exemplify or mimic or represent him. So then he changes a little bit and he said, goes back to his people, the psalmist does. And here again, you have to understand, they're going back to their homeland after being captured for 70 years. You can imagine them walking down the road, going back to the homeland, exiles. They've, they're, they're older now and they're on their way back to their homeland. Some of them surely 
uh, are younger than 70, probably haven't even seen the homeland. So they're excited. They're going back. They've heard about God and Israel and the temple and all of these things. So they're all walking back. And here's where the song breaks out where they say, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their, he is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, which are the leaders and the priests and those that are over the people, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. It's almost you can see this repetitive song where maybe the leaders are singing, O Israel, O house of Israel, ye that fear the Lord. And the people singing, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. They are convincing them in their way of praising to God, giving praise to God that they are, their trust is in him. They, don't, they know where they're going. Some have never been there. Others are longing to return. They don't know what's going to be waiting on them. They don't know what's in their future as they're going back to Israel. They don't know if the, very, the, the other inhabitants of the land have, have come and invaded them. They don't know what kind of difficulties they're going to face. They know their temple's been destroyed. The walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed. They don't know what it's going to look like. And yet they're singing this, trust in the Lord. O Israel, which means all of Ju Ju all the Jews. O house of Aaron, our priest that is going to restart the sacrifices. Everyone that fears the Lord, trust in him. He is their help and their shield. There's no doubt when we look at the sovereignty of God and being able to do whatever he chooses to do, Trusting in those decisions are vital to all Christians. It was vital to the Jews going back home. It's vital to us thousands of years later that we must trust in his sovereignty even when the answers we receive are not what we anticipate or it may not even be what we're asking him for. That is the trust in a sovereign God is that even when you're asking for healing or deliverance or whatever mercies you are asking God for, and it seems that you're getting a different answer or there seems to be silence at the time, you have to put your trust in the Lord because of his sovereignty that he knows what he wants in your life and he will make that happen. He will make it away even if you have to go through the difficulty. There's no doubt Paul in his life, and we have, it's interesting, I took a few minutes this, uh, this week just to reflect on his thorn in the flesh. Do you know how many hundreds of years theologians have battled and debated over what it was that could have been Paul's thorn in the flesh? They have taken every word out of that statement in 2 Corinthians and broken it down to what the Hebrew meant and what it meant in the context that he was writing it and what they went back to every other words that uh, in all the other epistles that he wrote to see how he used those same words. And, you know, they've come up with reasons that it was something physical because, and, and for those of us who remember this thorn in the flesh, he tells the writers, he tells the people of Corinthians, in order that I would not be um, lifted up or exalted, in order for me not to be exalted, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me so that I would not be exalted. And for years and years, everybody said, well, that's got to be a thorn in the flesh. Flesh means physical. Therefore, uh, it's got to be something physical wrong with, with Paul. And it could have been. We don't really know. The modern trend right now in breaking down the scriptures, they are believing, uh, if you read and, and you study this enough, most of the theologians believe it wasn't necessarily physical anymore. They now believe that it was everywhere Paul went. He was challenged. He was opposed. And as he would establish a church and he would go on to establish another one, Jews from Jerusalem would come in behind him and talk evil of him to try to break the church down. And he would have to write these epistles back to correct things that were coming in through these wolves that were entering in. Everywhere he went, he was challenged, opposed. And, 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 and what theologians believe is when he says, so that I would not be exalted, that the people themselves were prepared to exalt Paul because of his revelations and the miracles that followed Paul they were in tune of worshiping Paul. Paul would have to tell them that I'm, you know, not, not to do that, but this messenger of Satan who was out to destroy Paul and bring his name down and say, tell the people, don't listen to this guy. He didn't know what he's talking about. He used to be a destruct, uh, destroyer of Christians and it was all there. And he would, you remember Paul would go to the Lord three times and say, deliver me from this. 
And God's reply is, my grace is sufficient. My grace being my power is sufficient for thee. In other words, trust me, I am a sovereign God, and I know what the end result is going to be. You will have to suffer. You will have to go through this. You will not know the mysteries that I know, and you will not know fully the explanation of why I'm allowing you to go through all this. Just trust me. He, God could have easily explained to Paul, well, here's why you're doing Here's what I'm going to do. That's what I, wish, that's what I wish God would tell me at times. All right, Scott, here's the plan. All right, here's how, why you're going through this, because on the other side, this is where I'm going to get glory from it. But he doesn't do that. He, he wants us to trust him as they're singing this song, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. We are to do the same thing, even when we don't get an answer to our prayers the way we expect them. We still go through our difficult times trusting in the Lord. And we use Psalms like they use to build up our faith and to remind us about God is sovereign. He does what he chooses. He loves me and that's all I care. If he loves me and he does what he chooses, then I'm gonna be okay even if I die in this problem that I'm having. All right, he, he, he cares for me this much. So he says, the Lord, has been mindful of us. Sovereign, yes, but now personal. He knows us. He knows our name. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He saw us in captivity. He never left us. A lot of the Jews, remember, a lot of the Jews sitting in Babylon, they thought God was still back in the temple. They didn't know that God followed them. They didn't know God actually was over the whole universe. And all. They, their mindset was, he, we know he's in that holy of holies in the part of the temple that the priest goes in. Now the temple's destroyed. We're 100 miles away up in Babylon. But the psalmist is saying he's mindful of us. He knows where we are and our predicament and our situation. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Ye are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Here again, when you make heaven and earth, you're pretty sovereign. You're pretty powerful. You're almost incomprehensible when you create heaven and the earth. But as you trust in the Lord, he will bless you. Everyone that puts their trust in the Lord will be blessed. Now think of that. There are millions of people, I guess, that would say, I don't feel blessed. I don't feel blessed because life's a struggle. Do you know if... I thought about this, if God never, and we've, and we've talked about this before, if God never did one thing for us, but provide salvation, if he didn't heal us, if he didn't clothe us, if he didn't provide food for us, if he didn't do any of these things, but he provided a pathway of salvation, that is enough. That is enough to praise him. That's enough to love him because our eternity is now secure in him simply because of his plan of salvation for us that we have accepted with gladness and with joy. And we get, when we get depressed and, 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 and upset because things aren't going the way we'd like them to go or our neighbor is, is, is doing better than we're doing or God you know, is not uh, healing me of my sickness or whatever, providing salvation is enough to steal. Man, I praise you, Lord, for salvation. If I die in my sickness... I'll be there with you for all of eternity. I will, I will be in your presence. And that is enough. So in Psalm 65, David comes back in the scene, still talking about a sovereign God, a sovereign Lord. And he wants to echo this because he wants us to realize who the God is that we're serving and who we're praising. David was, he loved to reflect upon God. And we certainly believe that David knew him you know, he was he was a friend, and and uh, and 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 he knew God better than than anyone we believe. So when he wrote the 65th chapter of Psalms, he starts out with verse one by saying, "Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion." This is Jerusalem. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. And unto thee shall the vow be performed. That was the sacrifices that was planned. This was a time when the temple had not been uh, built yet. Uh, Solomon's going to build the temple. David is the king when he's writing this psalm. 
He is out in the, in the uh, is not even in Jerusalem. They're in a tabernacle, the similar tabernacle that Moses would have had during the, the wilderness. They brought it across Jordan with them. And he is set up in the tabernacle. But at this point, David knows that Jerusalem is going to be Zion. This is going to be the home of God. This is going to be the city of God. And in that, he knows that a temple is going to be built. It may not be built by him, but by his son Solomon. But the tabernacle is going to go there until the temple is built. And in, in anticipation of that, he is writing a song of praise. God, praise is coming. Praise is coming. It's coming to Zion. It's the city that you have put your name upon. And we are bringing the tabernacle in there. I'm excited. We're excited because the vow is to be performed there. Everything that you commanded us to do in the tabernacle to do, the, we're going to do it in your city. I, I can't wait. And he's given praise. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. And in verse 2, even though he's talking about a sovereign God, he says, O thou that hearest prayer. What a great statement for all of us. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. All flesh, why would David, a Jew, a man who believed that, you know, a man that grew up in a time where God commanded to wipe out the enemies, to wipe out these paganistic countries or nations, set up a kingdom for, for, for his people. You know, the Jews were notorious for believing that God was only for them. And here in this psalm, David is writing about something that most Jews would have been aghast at. Unto thee shall all flesh come, everybody, all four corners of the earth, all nations shall come to you, O God. This is a prophetic statement that David is making, not even knowing at the time that, you know, what Jesus, that Jesus, that Jesus is, uh, would, the Messiah would come, give his life. They were looking for a Messiah, don't get me wrong. They were looking for a Messiah that would come and, and, and elevate Israel. And, and, but here again, so many of the Jews had no idea that Gentiles like us would be included, that we're part of the all flesh. Those of us sitting here today as a fulfillment of this prophecy that all flesh shall come towards you, O thou that hearest prayer. Even though God's a sovereign God, he's still personal enough to where he hears our individual prayer. That's fascinating. When, when Jesus was asked, how do we pray? And he tells them the, you know, the, the, the Lord's prayer, as we know, there's a part of that in there that he asked God in, a, in, a, in letting us know the sovereignty of God. He says that part of our prayer is that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God hears our prayer, but our prayer acknowledges the sovereignty of God. When we pray to God, we don't want necessarily, or I, I'm going to refer to myself, I, I, tr I want to be reminded of the power that he has and, the, and his will for not only my life, but all of humanity. And when I pray to the Lord, I'm, I'm supposed to remind myself that it's not just praying my will be done, but thy will be done. It is so easy for even Christians to pray for my will because I'm struggling, I'm hurting, I know what I think is the answer, and therefore I plead. And there's scriptures that tell us to pour our hearts out to the Lord. He knows our every care, and we, we understand that. But Jesus told us to pray for you, thy will to be done on earth with me here on it as it is in heaven. In heaven, he directs everything. He directs everything on earth. I am a part of earth. I trust in the Lord and I trust in his will. I, I trust in the will not only of my individual life, but everything that's happened in the world around me. I believe it is under the will of God. Does that, does that mean that sin reigns as the will of God? No, but I believe that it's all part of his plan and he is not taken by surprise of any of it. Therefore, I will not fear what is happening around us because I believe in God's will will be done on earth and I pray for that. And, and so when we hear that thou that hearest prayer, it certainly tells us, unlike so many that have generations behind us that said that sovereignty of God meant that he didn't hear you, that you know he may have put the wheels in motion for all the earth to react but he doesn't get personal with you and that it's futile for you to pray to an incredible God, an incomprehensible God. Why do you think you can actually bend on your knee and pray to this God and that he would hear you? 
But we say that it's the, the absolute sovereignty of him is why we do pray. It's the incomparability of him. It is the, uh, uh, we can't even comprehend the size and the complexity of this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God. That's why we do pray, because he has the ability to hear us, because he does hear us, because he does work his will upon our individual lives the same time and the same way that he, he's operating the will on all of the world, the whole world, individually and corporately and worldwide, his will is being done. And then he comes down and he starts to talk about the enormity of God after he says that you know, uh, thou hearest their pr our prayer, our iniquities prevail against me. I'm always doing wrong, God. I'm sinning all the time. My iniquities are just prevailing against me. They're winning this thing. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Your mercy, your forgiveness and grace is going to purge away this battle that I'm having. And after he continues that, he, ver he jumps into verse 9, where he, has, he tries to give us a view of the sovereignty of God and how that when the pagans say, why do you worship a God you can't see or hear or taste or smell? Your five senses have nothing to do with this. He says, thou visiteth the earth. You didn't step back once you created it. You come to it. You live among us. You're here. You visit the earth and you waterest it. You give it nourishment. Thou greatly enricheth it with the river of God, with your provision, which is full of water. There is no limit to your provision. There is no limit to your, what you pour out. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly, and thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof, and thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys are covered with corn. They shout for joy, and they also sing. David's writing poetry here. It's a poem basically describing the sovereign God that does what he chooses, the sovereign God that created the earth and put everything in motion so that there would be provision. He put the water up in the ridges that it would roll down into rivers and into our oceans. He provided uh, uh, our fields for our uh, provision and place for the animals to eat. He has set everything in his incomparability. He set everything together in motion and created all. And we give him honor for that. We give him glory for that. We reflect upon that. When we say that we can't see a statue that we've built, that's our God. That represents God in heaven. I can see that and I can bow down to it. No, he's everywhere. I can drive down the road and see God. I can go to the mountains and see God. I can go to the coast and see God. I can sit by a creek bank and see God. I can go by a field of pasture or the cows grazing and I can see God because he built it all. He created it all. That's what a sovereign God can do. He does what he wishes. And he preserves it. He provides for it. He blesses it. And because of that, I can now know that he's a personal God. The same God that created all this knows my name, knows the hairs of my head, and he cares for me. Therefore, I can pray to him. Because even David says, that the old thou that hearest prayer, I'll pray to him because he's my personal God and he's a mighty God. No, I can't understand everything about him. I can, there's mysteries that I will never know. There are mysteries that none of us will ever know until we are there with him. And then we will know all. Paul tells us that down on this earth, we, we look through a glass darkly. We don't know why things happen. We, we, we're confused at times. But when we're there, we will know all. Automatically, we will know everything because we will be with him. But while we're down here, we trust. That's what we do. We trust in the Lord because we know with his power, he has the ability and the will to perform that which is good for us whether it's today or tomorrow or whenever, our trust will be with him. Sovereignty, a sovereign king, take joy in it. Don't be afraid of it. Certainly don't get caught up into the belief that because he's sovereign, he doesn't care, that you're non-existent in his eyes. You're too small. 
That's what the world, that's what the enemy would like us to believe is you actually believe that the God that created all these things actually knows you by name. How, how arrogant of you to think so. But we believe it through scriptures. We believe it because when he came into our heart, he changed us and he put a love in us. He put up a connection of, uh, uh, to, to him, a desire to be with him and to know him. We believe it wholeheartedly. And because we know that he is in our heart and we know that he's personal, we trust him. And while we trust him and, and, and as we trust him, we know that in the end, nothing can overcome his will. His will that he has established from the, the formation of the earth until the destruction of the same will go along the path that he so chooses. And that's the side I want to be on. That's the God I want to serve is the God who has already established the steps of everything. Not only the world events and the people therein, but he established it all the way down to me personally. You know, George Washington, it went, went through, um, you know, he was a deist at times, and, and, uh, but even he understood that providence played a role in his own life. Now, five different times he could have been killed. He had his hat shot off. He had holes, bullet holes through his coat, had horses shot out from under him. Uh, during the war, he was on horseback when a British officer snuck up behind him, pulled him, put the crosshairs on his back and could have killed George Washington before, the, uh, before the, the war was even over. But the man wouldn't shoot a man in the back. George had, was turned his back to him on horseback and he wouldn't shoot the general in the back. So he rode off into history and look where we are. Providence of God. Even Washington believed and understood that God has a plan and a purpose for everything and every individual. And I'm an individual on this earth and God has a plan for me. With that, we'll close this lesson. Next week, we're going to continue. Got two more weeks talking about the Psalms and what they can reveal to us and how they can help us. So we're going to enjoy the music today and, and ask for God to bless and, and prosper us. And we're going to praise him this week and we'll see you next week again at the appointed time.